a grand golf course and a pocket park, the dries and the wets, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities and by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. There are all sorts of places we gather in Columbus. Sometimes we gather to protest. A lot of times we gather to share a drink. It's a study in contrast, isn't it? All the places we get together. It really is. And sometimes when we get together, like over a game of golf, big ideas are hatched and begin to grow, much like the history of the Scioto Country Club. The Country Club movement develops in America first as a riding club movement. And it's only in the early 20th century that it becomes a golf club in one form or another. In Columbus, the first of those was the Arlington Country Club. It was a relatively wooded area, and uh, I know some of the holes played down the hill and across the tracks. And there was a swinging or a drop bridge that allowed the golfers to walk from the ridge of the golf course over the railroad tracks to the other side where they would reach the first hole. The second fairway then ran across Dublin Pike the third and fourth and fifth fairway were then along the river. The golfers then for the sixth hole drove back across the road, up the hill, back over the railroad tracks to the south end of the nine hole golf course. That was a challenge for any golfer. Following that was the Columbus Country Club in 1905 and the Scioto Country Club in 1916, designed by the noted golf course designer, Donald Ross. Four prominent Columbus businessmen, James Hamill, Samuel P. Bush, W.K. Landman, and Butler Shelton, traveled one day to Southampton, New York, and played an 18-hole golf course. After the round, they decided, hey, we ought to consider this for Central Ohio. When they realized that the nine holes at Arlington Country Club wouldn't suffice for the new trend in golf of 18 holes, our four founders went to the board of directors at Arlington Country Club and basically proposed the idea of Scioto with 18 holes, up-to-date, modern facilities. And what was interesting is the Arlington Country Club okayed this proposal and allowed for their members to join at a preferential rate. They really wanted to attract a national golf tournament. In 1920, the club hired George Sargent as their head golf professional. And this was a very fortunate hire for Scioto because George Sargent rose in the ranks of PGA professionals and became the president of the PGA in 1924. Him being president led us to negotiate and successfully land the 1926 U.S. Open and also the 1931 Ryder Cup tournament, which the United States was triumphant in a 9-3 score over Great Britain. The tradition of major golf continued in 1950 when we hosted the PGA Championship. Mayor Jim Rhodes was intimately involved and attracting Sam Sneed, Lloyd Mangrum, very prominent players of the time. 18 years later, in 1968, we hosted the U.S. Amateur. Subsequently after that, we hosted the 1986 U.S. Senior Open. 
The Scioto Country Club is really a landmark in this community. You know, it's the home of Jack Nicklaus, who's a very famous golfer and has done an awful lot for this community. As one of his good friends, Robin Obetz, described him, above average in everything that he did as a kid. He was an above average student, he was an above average athlete, and, and he took to golf at a very young age. Jack took his first golf lesson from our golf professional, Jack Grout. And before you knew it, he was winning state, national tournaments. And to think that Jack Nicklaus, the greatest golfer that ever lived, hit thousands of golf balls on our range, cut his teeth on our golf course, is really an awesome thought. On our centennial celebration, we will be hosting again the 2016 U.S. Senior Open. A hundred years has culminated. We've, we've hit that. So what's happening in the next 20 years, the next 40 years, and that's what we're trying to shape today. We're trying to remain relevant. We want to further the game of golf, and so hosting a championship, we just thought it was a, a neat thing that, that would draw the whole membership together. Craft brewing has taken hold here in Columbus, but remember the story of beer started a long time ago. It's a story about people gathering to keep their heritage alive, like the Germans who worked in the brewery district. And it's all about gathering ingredients to see what kind of flavors we can make with simple recipes. There's a science behind making beer, and a lot of new vocabulary words to learn, like wart, Ooh, I like that one. Sparging, ooh, even better. And adjuncts, which is not a professor, but a flavor additive. All beers start with a simple recipe. Add barley to water to create sugar. Hops to give it bitterness and aroma. And then yeast. Yeast, whose only purpose on this planet is to consume sugar. Yeast does three things that are a little bit uh, maybe PG-13 rated. Uh, first, uh, the yeast has sexy time in, inside the fermenter, so it multiplies. And then it also pees and farts. Yeast pee is alcohol. Yeast farts are carbon dioxide. And that, my children, is how beer is made. The taste of beer, now that's an interesting story. Before the Germans came to Columbus, breweries made ale, a darker brew, influenced by our British roots. As Columbus started evolving and the German immigrants started coming into town, uh, they brought a process that they called lagering, which now used a different strain of yeast, brewed at a colder temperature, resulting in a crisp, dry finish. Well, what's the difference between an ale and a lager? Ales are like red wine, lagers are like white wine. So they can also be paired up with food the same way. The 1870s showed the high point of number of breweries in our country. Columbus also saw that same growth, but something happened that was quite momentous and that's called Prohibition. It took a lot of breweries out of business. Those few breweries that survived Prohibition, the 13 years of Prohibition, came out on the other end and they started establishing bigger and bigger and bigger footprints. Also at that time, lagers were still popular. People had remembered them from the uh, German influence. So a lot of the other beer styles started going away and we got to be known as the most powerful, richest country in the world, known for exactly one beer style, the Pilsner Lager. The demand for different kinds of beer, different kinds of tastes, ales in particular, started in the 1970s when legislation allowed for small batches of brew. And we know it today as the craft brewing industry. Beautiful, now just tell me quickly, what do we have here? This is our summer wheat, our Pilsner, this is an IPA, our Scottish Ale, which is our biggest seller, and our Porter. Here's the Porter. <laughs> this is really an interesting taste. I would consider Columbus a really tight top tier two 
craft beer city right now. So order an ale or a lager or both. Cheers. And experience Columbus history in a new way. Oh, and here's another vocabulary word for you. Senosiliacophobia, the fear of an empty glass. The focal point of the temperance movement was in Westerville, Ohio. From there, they gathered their forces to stop alcohol production throughout the nation. So what happened when a craft brewery set up shop in the city once known as the dry capital of the world? Charlene tells us more. We're in historic Westerville today at Uptown Deli and Brew. I'm here to talk with Tony Kabalowski, owner of Temperance Row Brewing. He's got some great stories about ushering craft brewing into the birthplace of the nation's temperance movement. Brewing is done in the back of the building where you'll find pilsners, IPAs, and ales brewed right on the spot. You'll find the deli in the front of the building. There are signature sandwiches with Italian cold cuts and house fried potato chips. The fig about it with prosciutto, fig jam, and goat cheese is my choice for lunch. Yeah, that's a, that was a fun one. Coming up with them is kind of where it's kind of like, what do you love? And then put it together in a sandwich, right? So. Oh, yeah. And what you've done here is mm -hmm. to bring craft brewing back to the very place where this country's temperance movement got started. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? It, it wasn't necessarily because of that, but it's, it's here. And if you look at Uptown, it's a fantastic community. We've been dry in, in Westerville to 2005. And before that, if you came into town on a Thursday or even a Wednesday after seven o'clock, there was really nothing going on after the shops closed, right? So there was, uh, it was, the opportunity was here. What were some of the other hurdles that you had to deal with? Because I mean, already you're in the food business, so that's a right. challenge but you're bringing alcohol to a dry area. For most restaurants to uh, be able to make it, selling beer, or liquor, or wine actually helps a lot because the margins are so slim on the food side. So Westerville is really interesting that it's still technically a dry town. So every uh, place that serves uh, alcohol or liquor has to go on a ballot and get voted wet. So one of the challenges was you go on the ballot and you're not sure if, you, if the community will say yes or no. Fortunately, they, they said yes for us. Looking around at your decor, you actually celebrate the temperance movement and prohibition. Absolutely. If you look, uh, it's a celebration of both sides of the movement because if you read about it or watch anything about prohibition, there was two dramatic takes on it. It's not just the moral side, there's a financial side, and uh, Westerville is in the heart of that uh, debate. So we obviously we lean one way, but we celebrate both sides here. Was there anything that you learned um, about prohibition and the way it changed American culture that's been especially meaningful for you? Well, it's just fascinating and there's so much to it. Like the income tax, part of the reason we have income tax is when uh, prohibition first started, there's a revenue stream that was lost because now there's no more liquor to tax. And then uh, that pivoted it again when the depression hit, the income tax uh, became a lot less because there was a lot less work. And so that's part of the reason the prohibition ended was because the federal government was looking at a way to boost revenue so they allow the sale again, right? So even here, Westerville is a really good microcosm of that same philosophy because forever we there were no alcohol and then the uptown area is, is, uh, is thriving now because just a little bit, right? So that balance I think is really interesting. You sound like you had to become a historian. Yeah, yeah I became kind of a prohibition nerd uh, doing some <laughs> research here trying to Put it all together, yeah. Westerville in, in particular had a, a gentleman, uh, Henry Corbin, that opened a uh, saloon in 1875 and the townspeople actually bombed uh, the, the saloon on the first night. Oh, so then he rebuilt and they bombed again. And four years later, he built at another site and they totally destroyed that building. And that was it. And then that was the last beer served in, uh, in Westerville to 2005. So in honor of Mr. Corbin, we have a, a beer call here called Corbin's Revenge uh, because we're just trying to get back a little bit for... <laughs> I hear you have another interesting one, though. Tell me about 40-ton Porter. After the initial bombing of Corbin Saloon, the Anti-Saloon League moved their national headquarters here. And on Otterbein's campus now, they had about 11 acres where they built homes and apartments uh, for the higher-ups of the, the movement. Well, they started printing, and if you look at a lot of propaganda, a lot of it was printed here in Westerville. They printed and mailed out 40 tons of uh, propaganda against alcohol out of Westerville. Uh, Westerville was one of the first towns to have a uh, first class post office because of the sheer volume that was coming out. And because of that 40 ton, once circling back again on the history, 
We are, our porter is called 40 Ton Porter. I gotta give you credit, you have been really imaginative incorporating all of this into your business and making this place a tribute to the history of this area. Well, it, the history is so rich here, which you touched on, that's what we draw our name from. And one thing leads to another, and you see one picture and you read one story, and it takes you uh, down a path that you weren't expecting, and next thing you know, you just find something that's just uh, truly fascinating. So, yeah, we're really, really pleased here. This segment takes us into the little-known gathering places of artifacts at the Ohio History Connection. Those are the collections we rarely get to see. And let me guess, more beer stuff? More beer stuff. I mean, come on, it's Columbus. Perfectly normal. Okay. It's a great part of our collection of local materials related to Columbus and um, of course we have four bottles here from, from your family's brewery right. and I was actually hoping that you could maybe talk a little bit more about the, uh, the bottles themselves, maybe the, uh, the interesting uh, flip top lids that we, that we see on those. Sure, this is um, probably 1880s, 1890s, up to about 1900. Um, what we take for granted is what's called the crown top. The crown top is the basic bottle cap. Um, unfortunately, the guy who invented the crown top was an ardent prohibitionist. And he prevented the breweries for a long time from being able to use his crown top invention. Wagner bought out all of the rights to Hoster products, and the Hoster slogan was always, that's the beer. Well, now that we're into prohibition, uh, you can't make beer, obviously. So instead of that's the beer, Wagner has the slogan, that's the product. So he made a variety of soft drinks, ginger ales and stuff. One of my personal favorites are um, these bottles right here from the Franklin Brewing Company, yes. also from Columbus. The label specifically mentions the Kreuzen process. Yeah. Kreuzen, of course, is a German word, sometimes spelled with the umlaut or the two dots over mm -hmm. uh, to place the accent on, on one of the vowels. Uh, but these bottles, which I would say date to around 1940 or so, um, conspicuously take away the umlaut. And when you consider that in terms of the context of World War II exactly. and rising anti-German sentiment, I think that and shows you how objects just like beer bottles can have really great historical significance sure. and tell us about so many other topics sure, in history. Absolutely. And I, I, I can just say that one of the hardest things to find on beer bottles is the original labels. I mean, they uh, are made of pretty fragile paper. They certainly were not made of archival paper. Nobody thought this is going to be something we're gonna preserve for the ages. So it's great when you, when you do have a beer bottle that has the authentic label, you get an idea this is what that beer looked like back in the day. Uh, this is stuff that we don't always see it's from the people who worked at the breweries. There's a story that back in the old days, all brewery workers had unlimited free beer. You could get all the free beer you wanted if you worked at the brewery. That's great. And uh, these pieces in particular come from uh, one of the local uh, labor union leaders from Columbus who was associated with um, soda and brewery and distillery unions. Uh, from the 30s into about the 1970s. And I think it's also important people realize that they shouldn't just be throwing stuff out that uh, tell the stories of their lives or their parents or grandparents. There are stories to be told and this stuff is worth preserving and uh, you're, you're certainly doing a great job here. We certainly appreciate your efforts. We appreciate you sharing your knowledge about your family's history and um, the role of brewing in, in local Columbus history, too. So sure. Thanks. thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Sure. We took you to the birthplace of one of the biggest golf tournaments in the country. And gathering there made some big ideas come to reality. Now we're taking you to a smaller space where we hope big ideas also take hold. Nine neighborhoods recently received a Parcels to Places grant to create small parks on abandoned city-owned lots. We followed along as two of those small parks started to take shape. Old Town East has had a lot of issues with uh, vacant lots and mostly starting with vacant houses that have gone into decay and uh, been condemned. But once they're taken down, then they have to be taken care of after that. So they you know, are mowed by the city. Um, 
and if the city can actually get those lots into hands of people that either want to rebuild on those lots or do something special with them, then that obviously is a boon to the city and a boon to the neighborhood as well. Healthy Homes is a nonprofit um, housing initiative that was started by Community Development for All People and Nationwide Children's Hospital. Our current goal is to reduce vacant, abandoned, and blighted properties in our area. So we're standing right now at 941 Carpenter Street. It's a lot that we acquired several years ago and we're looking into redeveloping as a new build. Uh, but the more we looked at it, we couldn't get any off-street parking because there's no alley access and it just wouldn't have been a good fit for a new build. Uh, directly next to us is 949 Carpenter Street and at that time there was actually a property on that lot but the house was in such disrepair that the city was able to demolish it and we purchased the lot from the city land bank. We had initial discussion about combining the lots and uh, doing a new build on the lot, but as more thought went into it, I began to think about does neighborhood revitalization always have to end up being just more housing? So I started looking into some other options and have found out some information about an urban force in Seattle and decided to bring that idea to our board for discussion. And our board approved it and we moved forward to make plans to build it. We learned that there was basically a contest being sponsored by the city um, and it was called Parcels to Places. The city had multiple vacant lots available and they said, hey, if you can give us a plan for these lots, we could potentially give you some financing or funding for that. Within the neighborhood here in Old Town East, one of the featured lots that we saw was on Ohio Avenue. It's the entrance into the neighborhood off of Broad Street. Ohio Avenue hasn't really been paid attention to a lot uh, as Old Town East is developing. So we entered that contest. We were lucky enough to be one of the participants who were awarded a grant for that. And through Parcels and Places, we did secure a $15,000 grant. There were nine finalists. They are all over the place in terms of what they wanted to do. Our idea, just to bring you know, public gardens to the neighborhood and also welcome to the neighborhood. There'll be a sign uh, behind us right here that says Old Town East, and it'll be fairly large so you see it off of Ohio as you're coming into the neighborhood. Yeah. I hit something solid with a shovel. Wow, I got some brick down there, huh? <laughs> uh, before we touched it, it was mostly weeds and a lot of concrete and rubble mixed into the, the ground. It wasn't a very good demolition job, really. Uh, it was uh, pretty rocky, but a lot of times the the inert material of the foundation is dumped into the basement. Anything that would decay, such as wood, is supposed to be pulled out. And then after that, it's supposed to be backfilled with soil. Well, if you look up here, you see a structure being created. And this will be um, an area of shared space or meeting space or coverage in case it starts raining. This is the backside of where the urban forest will be. And this is where our line of uh, fruit trees will begin. We're going to have about 13 to 18 raised flower beds throughout the forest. We will actually have two raised beds that will be handicap accessible in the forest as well. I think this park will be a signature park in Columbus. Uh, not only will there be garden beds and lending library and this custom you know, bike rack uh, and an entry into the park, it will be a place where people want to come and enjoy themselves, be able to garden and uh, it, you know, hopefully it's something that people look to as uh, a space that they point out in the neighborhood as something special. What I'm really looking forward to is not only having fresh fruits available to the neighborhood, but being able to provide programming in the park. We are looking to link up with um, Livingston Avenue Elementary School so that we can provide some type of programming for their students here, um, cooking lessons, gardening lessons, all those type of things. We would like to have the garden function as that and also be another meeting place where people can get out, learn who their neighbors are, associate with people more, and uh, talk more about what's going on in the community and work towards uh, improving it even more.
Thanks for spending time with us. And remember, you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. I'm trying my beer, cause I'm still missing you. So tonight I'm drinking for two. I'm drinking for two. I'm sad and I'm blue. Get to the curb just like an old show. So pour me another long overdue. So tonight I'm Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by At American Electric Power, We've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State auto insurance companies, serving customers and communities for nearly a century. Today, a technology and transformation company. Risk takers, creators, innovators. A company defined not by its history, but by its people. State auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine. Marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health. Focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU, thank you.